Good afternoon, good evening, or if you're calling in from Australia like Greg Lowe and a couple of his coworkers, good morning. So my name is Charles Sterling, and welcome to uh, the second of this week's uh, uh, Power BI webinars. Uh, this week, actually, Greg's going to go through some of the classes that he actually go delivers in Australia in some of the more popular topics that he gets requested. Um, I see that I've got a couple of the old timers on the phone. Charles Webb, thanks for joining us. I see Hans Christensen, um, who runs, he's at Cap Gemini, but he runs the the very very active user group in Norway. And if you actually want to know how to integrate Dynamics and Power BI, next week they're actually having a presentation in Norway on that topic. So Christy Cantor was asking, did I miss the presentation? Christy, you didn't miss the presentation. Uh, if you got a reminder a couple hours ago, saying then we're going to start in one hour. That was a hiccup on the ON24 platform. We apologize for that, but the start time is 2 o'clock because this is oh dark 30 for Greg. Um, one other question or one other statement is if you haven't done one of these webinars before, um, you actually can't talk to us. You actually have to type it in the Q&A window, and that's where I'm actually reading these questions from. So my name's Charles Sterling. I'll be answering some of your questions. we got Bill from ON24. And if Greg has pauses, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read your question to him. Um, so with that, a lot of times I actually do a pretty, a, a pretty weak introduction to my presenters because I just don't know them yet. I'm still new to the Power BI team. But in Greg's case, I actually have known this guy for 20 years. Um, he was one of my first MVPs I nominated. Uh, he's super active in the community. He, back then, he was based in Queensland. At that point, I don't know if this is still the case, he actually had more of the Microsoft certified exams passed than any other person on the, on, on the planet. Um, we also, I don't know if you guys have heard of the regional directors, but we have two outstanding community com contributors across each country that we recognize. Greg was so good that we actually had to request a third so we could make him a regional director for Australia. So not just an MVP, not one of the most recognized Microsoft certified trainers and uh, exam takers, but also a regional director. Um, since then, when I was working with him, he's moved from Brisbane to Melbourne, and he actually runs the SQL Down Under, a very popular company, training company, and podcast. So if you haven't made his podcast, make sure and do that. So, Greg, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself that I missed, and tell us about what we're going to cover today. Hi, hey folks. How are we doing? The, yeah, thanks, thanks for the intro, Chuck. The, uh, so, look, yeah, where I fit in, I uh, head up uh, SQL Down Under locally, which is uh, no big deal because there's only a handful of us. The uh, uh, part, Still part of the RD program, and nowadays they call us data platform MVPs um, in around SQL Server. Uh, in terms of uh, other things, though, I mostly do some uh, writing and uh, podcasts and things, but the, the vast majority of my time I do consulting work at the moment, and uh, uh, pretty much most of that time at the moment is in large financials um, uh, and software houses. And so uh, software houses are a real passion of mine as well. But nonetheless, so m make a start. So look, the, the topic today, we had a little confusion uh, in the detail that was up uh, on the pre-release material. So just to be really, really clear, so the, the things that we're going to talk about today uh, are really just getting comfortable uh, and started with Power Query. So uh, if you're already a sort of a gun Power Query person, uh, maybe uh, get, come in towards the end and just ask questions. But this is really targeted at people that just want to get their head around Power Query uh, pretty much from beginning to end. So that's what we're aiming, but just to set the level of, of what we're aiming for first up. So listen, when you're using Power BI, and and in fact, other, other tools will come to, uh, obviously you need to be able to get data from a, a wide variety of places. And one of the things they've done a very good job of in, in Power BI is having pre-built ways of getting to the data. Now, in the case of uh, the, the built-in options in Power BI, We've got content libraries or content packs, basically, and alternately, you can connect directly to the data. But one of the things that they've done a really nice job of are the content packs. And so you can imagine that if I'm connecting to, an, uh, let's say, the data in an application, it's one thing to be able to connect to the database and to be able to get to the tables and the views and so on. But in many cases, if you connect at that level, 
it's not really going to make it very, very easy for you to get to the, uh, the data that's inside there. The content pack sort of wrap that up to a higher level where we can then sort of uh, look at maybe entities or you could look at cu concepts like customers or clients or advertisements or things like that. So a, a higher level concept. Now, the tools that we need to use to go out and find data though, and then this is where Power Query comes in. So where this first appeared, uh, it came out as a free add-in for Excel 2010. Uh, and it's built in to, to current areas like Excel 2016. Um, but this was the sort of first available version. And the aim of this was to have a way of going and finding data, uh, to be able to bring the data in, then to sort of change the shape of it so that it's in a shape that is sort of suitable for what we're looking for. And then finally, to then be able to load that in a way that we could make use of it. Now, in the case of Excel, that was either we could load the data in and just have it as a table in Excel, or we could load it up. Uh, they had introduced Power Pivot at that stage. And so the alternative is that we could load this up as a set of data uh, that was then part of the data model that we would have inside there in Power Pivot. And we could deal with it just like data that came from anywhere else. Now, one of the things that they have done a good job here with is the number of built-in data sources. And so there are sort of a very, very large number of data sources that come sort of pre-built with the product. And this is actually a pretty good indication. People often talk about, you know, the new Microsoft. And the idea that they went and wrote a whole lot of adapters for a very wide range of things just gives you an idea how very different that is to, to how things used to be done. So I must admit, I did not think... Um, in the short term, I would have seen, say, Microsoft writing a, an adapter for Google Analytics or, a, or writing a Facebook adapter or things like that. But, but these adapters and so on are all part of the product and already built in. And this, this makes a world of difference when you're building, uh, trying to build something based on that data. So, for example, um, Facebook has a graph API you can connect to. There's a, a low-level API. Now, you could connect to that, and you could then start to try and work out how to navigate the graph in, in your application and so on, and then start to try and make sense of the whole thing. Alternately, you can work with a data source that's already built, and that's going to give you a concept of friends and uh, those sorts of things rather than really low-level concepts. And it, it was very interesting the first time I used Power Query, for example, just to go into connect off to Facebook, pull down a list of friends and start analyzing your friends, right? Uh, this is interesting. And, but you'll notice also there are a wide range of other places we could connect to immediately. Now, to give you an idea of the sort of power of this, though, part of the deal is being able to sort of transform the data. And so let me, let me show you what that looks like. Now, on the rare occasions uh, when I get to have some free time and uh, I've been spent, do get to spend some time at home in Melbourne, um, one of the things that I tend to try and do on a, a Tuesday night, if, if I get a chance, is at the local Doncaster Hotel, there's a whole lot of friends go along and trivia nights are a, a sort of a fairly popular thing in Australia. Probably more so in Melbourne than I used to find they were in Brisbane, maybe. Um, and I think that's also because it's so cold here, a lot, of, particularly during winter. Uh, people will tend to go along and sort of congregate somewhere like that. Now, the, the trivia that we go along to there, one of the things they would do every week is they would then send us a homework question uh, where we could go off and try to work out the answer to some question so that then when we turned up the next week, uh, we, we already had you know a question or two or something that we already knew the answer to. Now, one of the weeks, the, one of the questions they asked us is, out of all the, the Miss Universe winners, which country had had the most? And, okay, so how do we answer that? Now, the, the typical thing we would do with that is I'd go into a search engine and so I'd say, look, look for list of Miss Universe title holders or something. 
Uh, and I'd gone searching for that. And no surprise, it's, it's usually Wikipedia or something is going to be the, the place I would find that. And so I searched in Wikipedia, and of course there was a, a nice table there of all of the different title holders across the years. Now, the question is, how do I then analyze that, just simply to break that down by country? Now, normally what I would do when I'm confronted with a table like this in, in a web browser is I would start at the top left and I would go off and start to highlight this and then I would normally copy that and paste that into a copy of Excel and then that would allow me to then have a way to go and sort the data. However, I tried and tried and tried to do that and the thing that made it very, very difficult is that some helpful soul in the country territory column here had gone and put a flag in beside the name of the country. Now, now that made it diabolical to try and copy that data and to extract the country out of that quite easily. Now, had I had Power BI at the time, I could have, e or Power Query, sorry, at the time, I could have easily done this. Now, what I ended up doing, because they didn't have a table that gave me totals back then, uh, what I ended up doing is sort of right-click view source and then go off and sort of process the HTML myself, which is an incredibly nasty way of doing things. So let me give you an example. Uh, had I had Power Query there, so if I now go into Excel, now when you first added Power Query, it used to be a sort of a separate ribbon up the top. Uh, but what, you, what you've now got, uh, if you look at the data tab, uh, on the data ribbon, there, there's now uh, basically just it's been embedded directly and you've got this concept of queries. And so I can say, look, give me a new query and then I have various locations that I can get the new query data from. And so in this case, if I say, look, from other sources, one of the options I've got is from a website. Let's pop that up and I'll put in the URL. And OK. Now, what Power Query does is it goes and takes a look at that page and it's finding anything that appears to be sort of tabular data that's contained on that page. Now that takes it a moment to go and, and look and do that, but it's, it's needing to analyze all that. Now, once it finds that, it'll give you a list of, here are things that look like tables, and you'll find that as I sort of click on any of the ones on the left, what it will do then is give me a preview of the data that it's seeing on the right. And so in this case here, I notice that uh, you'll eventually see, and I know there's a little bit of a delay when you're watching this, um, but when, you, when I've clicked on table zero, it's actually got the data I'm after. So I've got the year and the country and the winner and, and so on and so on. Now, I could just say load. So the options down here, let's see if Zoom it works in this. And so I've got an option here to sort of load this Now, I could load this directly, and that would just push it in as a table inside Excel. Or alternately, I could load that into the data model, and I could push that off across into Power Pivot uh, internally in Excel as well. The other option I've got here, of course, is I could say, look, I want to edit this query. And so the edit is the option where I say, look, I want to do some transformation on this data before I bring it in. So let's do that. So if I say edit, this then opens the Power Query edit window. Now again, this still this looks a bit Excel-ish, but some subtle differences here. So I have got a little formula bar across the top. 
and you'll notice it's got equals table dot transform column types and so on. It gives you an, an immediate hint that we are talking about some sort of transformations that, that can be done inside here. But let's just start by trying to clean this up a little bit. I can give the list here, I could say, look, these are the winners and give the, the query a name. It's got steps here. We'll come back to that later. Um, but so notice I've got a year and then the country and then nicely it's separated the country out for me. It's got who it was that won. It's got an age column, but notice the name of that. It's, it's a little strange the way the name ended up. So it's got age bracket, A bracket. So first thing we could do is right click the top of that column and say, look, let's just rename that to age because may, maybe we do want to analyze the age. Height is a little bit of a problem. Um, and I don't love my US friends, but one day you've, you've got to lose the imperial measures, right? Um, but anyway, so look, the height in here, so feet and inches, that's problematic. And further down the list, even more problematic, um, notice there are things like five foot seven and a half inches and so on. Now that starts to get a little bit nasty uh, to work with. All right. So maybe we will come back. So let's get the pageant date. I'll just remove that column. I don't want that. Uh, the entrance, I'm just going to rename that and say, look, uh, let's call that number of entrants. That's fine. But then let's try and do something on the height. Now, in the case of the height, uh, this is a, a piece of text, unfortunately. And I want to end up being able to work with that as, as a bunch of numbers instead. And so I'm, I'm after height here in Australia. I, I would like that to be in centimetres instead. And so if I start with this height, and notice I can right-click the column header and say, what I want to do here is split the column, and I can say by a delimiter. And I'm going to choose a custom delimiter and I'll just say OK. In fact, I'll do it just at the leftmost for the moment. Now, a couple of things have happened uh, once, once I click on that and do that. So the first thing, if we zoom in here a little bit, you'll notice that it's broken that height column into two columns. So it's now height one and height two. Height 1, notice, is now right aligned, where height 2 is still left aligned. And so what's happened is it's realized now that the height in height 1 is actually a number, but we do have control over that. So let's rename height, and I'll just call that, oh, let's just call that feet, shall I? All right, now the height 2 column I've still got a problem that I've got my half values and things like that still tucked down inside here. And so what I can do with this, I, if I right click where it's got seven and a half and then say replace values, I get the option to say, look, everywhere you find a particular thing, let's go and replace that with something else. And so in this case, I'm, it's not the seven and a half I want to replace. It's just the half. So let me get rid of the seven and say, look, every time you see a half, let's put a 0.5 in instead. And OK. Now, the other thing I might want to do is just have a look and see if there's any of the data where that's going to be a problem. And that's actually fairly clean in this case. Um, this Doing that, though, depends on the time of the year that I happen to show you this. And what's important here is that normally, when we get to the next year, for example, uh, they would already have another row in the bottom of the table saying, look for you know 2017, who, who is the person, and so on. But because it hasn't been held, perhaps, uh, they'd often have TBA or something in there saying, you know, to be advised. And so what I might need to do is to knock out some of the column or some of the rows to get rid of things like that. 
Okay. Now, in terms of this height, I should now have converted this into something that could be a number. And so if I say, look, I now want to change the type of that to a decimal number, uh, then these values will immediately right align and it's okay. Now, if it didn't like it, at that point I would have an error, potentially, and it'll, it's pretty good at telling me what the error is and allowing me to go in and sort of try and fix that. And importantly, up in the top area here, I also have the ability to say, look, get rid of the errors or just keep the errors. So that way I could go through and just look at the ones that are problematic and fix those up. All right. Now let's rename, so height two. Now I'm going to call that inches. And now I've got feet and inches, but I, but I actually want uh, centimeters in this case. So I've got an option on the add column ribbon to add a custom column. And so let's call that height. And we'll drag across, I've got feet. And I could say by uh, something like 30.54 and then inches by, was it 2.53 or 2.54? Let's say 2.53 and okay. And that's now added me my additional column uh, I could also say, hang on, I, I don't really, I don't really care about somebody's height to two decimal places. So I could then say, look, let's transform that and round that down. So that'll give us a sort of a whole number. Now, the other thing is that once I have that in the data set, notice I could go and select feet and inches, and I could say, look, remove those columns. Notice there's also options very conveniently in a lot of this to remove other columns. So in many cases, when you go and select something, you can either work on it or you can do things to all the things apart from the ones that you have selected in a few cases. That's actually quite useful. Um, and notice I can remove that. Now, what's very different about this to something like Excel is that notice if I'd done that normally in Excel, all of a sudden my height column would now have all sorts of problems because I have removed the data that it was actually based on. But in this case, this is actually just a series of steps that have been applied. And you'll notice over here in the applied steps that what we've then got is step by step, what did this look like at each stage as we were making these changes? And importantly, most of these that have some, well, the ones that have some sort of thing that we configured have a little cog thing in here, allowing us to go and change the setting. And as long as we don't do something that then breaks the rest of it going forward, uh, we can go and change how we did that thing back at that stage. We can also insert steps prior. We can delete steps and so on. Now that may have flow on effects going forward, but the ability to look at what this looked like at each stage and be able to sort of manipulate it like that that's a, that's a world of goodness, being able to do that. All right. Now, once I've now got that data in, in a pretty good sort of shape. And so the idea with this is this then becomes a set of data that I could then use uh, like, like other data that I've sourced from any other location. So if I said, for example, close and load two, In this case, now it's suggesting that it wants to put this into a table, or it could say, look, just go off and create the connection to this. And what we might do is instead of putting it into an Excel table, we could say, look, add this to my data model and load. And what that's going to do is a couple of things. It's going to put the data into Power, Piv uh, Power Pivot inside Excel, which, which is then sourced like any other table, but it's also added, notice over on the right here, it's added this winners now as a query, which is now part of this workbook. And so if we go into Power Pivot and open the manage window for Power Pivot, 
you'll see that this is now just a normal set of data sitting inside here. Now, with this as well, importantly, this is not a one-off that we've just done this the one time. Uh, notice on the refresh, I could just click refresh and say, look, refresh this table, and that'll go back and rerun the query. It'll go and screen scrape the page. It'll go and apply all my transformations and everything required to bring that back up to the current state. Now, if I found something went wrong at that stage, that's okay too. Uh, that, that would be okay. Um, and maybe I then need to go back and fix the query. And this is why it's important that the workbook query is still there um, because I could edit that. So for example, if I look back over in here, and if I hover over the workbook query, give that a moment to catch up. And so if in the workbook pane, if I hover over the query, it shows me the data that's underlying that and shows me where it's been loaded to, shows me the columns that are contained. And it's also showing under there the data source, originally where this data came from. Now, if we go back and um, back into Power Pivot, of course, this is now a set of data I can analyze like any other data. So if I said, look, give me a, I'd like a uh, pivot chart. And let's do that on a new worksheet. And so this is now a data set that, that I can work with. And so I could say, look, the, all I really want to do here is analyze, let's say, on the axis of the country. Uh, and I want, uh, let's do a count of the winners something like that, and we start to get the idea, and well, there you go. So for the US people, they, 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 uh, there are more from the US than anywhere else at the moment. So it was eight, just edging out Venezuela. But anyway, you get the, the basic idea that we can use that like a table of data, refresh it, and if we need to, um, we can go back and edit this query and do further transformation on it if required. But this has allowed us to source a set of data, to change it to the shape we want, and then use it from that point on. Now, I use that from a website, but there's absolutely nothing that says it has to just come from something like a website. Of course, when I say new query and other sources, there are many, many, many places that I could go off and get this data from. In addition, a topic for another session sometime, uh, but there's the data catalog and the idea of being able to sort of share queries and being able to push things into a data catalog and then be able to sort of say, hey, I want a query that somebody else has done or that I have done previously. All right, let's go back and see. Just talk a little more for just a moment. Okay, now, so that was Power Query sitting inside Excel. One of the nicest tools that have been released in recent years is Power BI Desktop. And so in the case of Power Query, it's got very, very similar capabilities, but directly built into a Power BI Desktop. I think of Power BI Desktop almost like a, a single thick client um, desktop tool that combines the sort of the power of Power Query for doing this, of Power Pivot, because it has the ability to, to build data models, and also uh, we've got what was in Power View, where we've got the ability to sort of build reports and things directly off that as well. Now, it's got an even wider set of data sources. Um, this list I took from the July uh, 2016 release. Uh, I noticed the August 2016 release came yesterday uh, and I've installed that. So that's that of course is always entertaining the day before I show somebody something. But nonetheless, we'll find out if anything changed on the fly. Um, but there was a new release yesterday. And the important thing though is that this list just keeps getting bigger all the time. And as I said, it's it's a very, very different world where you have Microsoft sort of building, you know, Facebook connectors, analytics connectors, GitHub connectors, MailChimp connectors, and so on and so on and so on. Um, and in conjunction with, in many cases, the people from those organizations 
also in many cases helping to build these sort of connectors. Now, we mentioned that when we go to load the data, you've got a choice with, again, with, so loading the data directly or sort of editing and changing the data, pushing it into the appropriate shape before we work with it. All right, so that's the, the basic sort of acquiring data using Power Query. Now, just tell you a couple of things about transforming the data. And so this is clearly a really visual way of doing it. Now, this is one of the things I think is the biggest power of Power Query is the fact that unlike integration services, which is what I spend an awful lot of my time working with normally, it's, it's much easier to see what's going on. And I, I do wish, actually, the uh, integration services team might be looking very carefully at what's going on here in uh, Power Query, because there are so many things that it'd be nice to be able to do very, very dynamically, and just to make a change and be able to see what effect that has on the data flowing at a certain point. Um, where what I find in other tools and actually integration services is one of the better ones for that compared to some of the uh, competitive ones. And so what I'm, what I'm having to do there is sort of endlessly building formulas and things, but, but I'm not getting that sort of dynamic in your face view of what's going on. And the other thing about it is that it's much, much easier in something like Power Query to go back and make changes to the work you've already done. Uh, where whenever you start doing that in most integration packages, you're stepping back further up, a, I don't know, a data flow or whatever. And the problem is then getting those changes to sort of flow forward uh, is usually a lot more work than it is here. And in many cases in Power Query, you're going to get away without having to build formulas at all, simply because they have so many transformations already built into the product. Now, we mentioned that queries themselves have names, and so particularly important if you load this into a data model, because that will become the, the, the name of the table, effectively, inside the data model. We can, as I said, we can go back and edit steps. We can delete steps. We can insert steps back up, not even just at the end, but we can insert steps further back up the list. Now, the number of transformations has been growing absolutely nonstop, and there is a rich set of them already built in there, and again, this is an area that keeps improving. And so we saw a number of those in use in the, in the last demonstration. I'll, I'll show you a few more as, as we keep going forward. And also, even though the ribbons have a large amount of, uh, large number of options, there are a lot of options in context menus. So as I said, keep in mind the idea that if I click the, a heading of a column, then basically I get a whole lot of uh, things that apply directly to the column. If I'm clicking in a particular cell, then basically I'm getting things that apply directly to that. And so notice things like number filters. So I've clicked in this example on the screen, on the slide, I've said, you know, here's some number, I can say number filter, and then with that, I could say, look, you know, doesn't equal this, only equals that, and so on. I have those sorts of options sitting inside there. There's also, maybe if we get time to talk about later, but ability to sort of drill down to lower levels inside here as well. Now, what I want to show you is just the beginning of something else where we go off and sort of do a data transformation. Now, one of the things that I have regularly, anybody... I suppose doing any work in IT, uh, part of the bane of your life is that there are CSV files all over the place. I, I cannot believe how much organizational data seems to live inside CSV files in organizations. And so let me go and find, show you an example here where I've got some CSV files that I uh, put in place here. Get to the folder for this. And here in this folder, I've got a set of CSV files that are holding budgets that need to be processed. Now, there's a couple of things about these files. One is that there's a budget file per year. Now, that's important because part of the data that I'm looking for 
is in the name of the file itself. So it's not just the contents of the file, the, the name of the file is as important as anything else. Now, if I open up and look at what's inside here, in fact, let me open this with Notepad. Oh, that's pretty big. But uh, it'll give you the idea. What it is is a standard CSV file where there's just a whole bunch of headings and then we've got a sort of row by row breakdown of data under that, just common to limited. In fact, let me open that in another copy of Excel. In fact, let me open it in the same copy of Excel. And delimited. And it's comma delimited. Let's just bring this in so I can see it. All right. So what I've got in here, uh, I've got cinema groups. This is These are budgets for cinemas. And so there's a cinema group short code. There's a sales territory that each one's associated with. Uh, and then we've got the data. But notice it's pivoted out. So we've got January to December values across the pay, across the rows here. So I, I really need to change the shape of this uh, before I can work on it. All right, so let's have a look. We could do it in either, either tool, but let's actually do this with Power BI Desktop. There's all the wonderful what's new. All right, so but if I say, look, get data, and I could say from a CSV file and point at this budget file and open. And again, exactly the same sort of experience. It's giving me a preview window saying, look, this is what I can see inside this. You want to load this, which again would just pick that up and push it into the data model in this case. Notice there's no other load options because it isn't Excel. We're, we're here. We're in Power BI Desktop. Or we could say edit. And so let's say edit. And that puts me in the tool where I can start to modify this. But notice it's a very, very similar environment to what we had in Excel. It's a little more up to date. In fact, it's uh, uh, it's had updates pretty much every month, uh, if you look at how these tools have been evolving. This is both a challenge and, and a beauty, right? So the beauty is you get amazing new things every month. The challenge is that you get amazing new things every month, right? So, so it, there, there is a little cycle of getting your head around, you know, what's going on. But what I love with this is that the team who put this out, uh, what the guys there do is that they generate a video every month that sort of walks you through all the things that have been done. And so that, that's actually, and they also have separate videos there that show each of the individual things that were contained in the main video. And so that's really important if you ever want to go back and sort of look at, you know, how would I have done any of these things? Okay, so same sort of thing. So notice I can right click the heading. I could say, look, I'll rename that to just Cinema Group. Uh, sales territory is fine. I've got a whole series of figures here. So notice I can click here, shift click at the end, and then on the transform, I could say, look, let's unpivot the columns. And I could have also unpivoted the other columns. And so that'll bring that around for me. If I right click the heading here now, so let me grab that column and rename. I could say this is now the short month name and this one over here I'll rename and I'll say that's now the budget um, and so this is this is great um, but this has gone off and read the data for this 2008 so so I've got still a little bit of a challenge here in that part of the data is still in the file name but what I've got here is the ability to read a particular file so, okay, so we need a couple more things to be, to be able to do this uh, appropriately. Just 
pause that for the moment and we'll come back to that one. Okay, so the thing I want to mention is that what I see Power Query as is Power Query is a wrapper over the top of a language called M. So M is a, a manipulation language. It's a data manipulation language. Uh, for old timers in the industry, M actually used to, used to be mumps. So in fact, if you go looking for old things about M, you might run into mumps. Um, but that, that was a very old language. Um, but the M is now this sort of data manipulation language. The thing that is wonderful about it is that Microsoft have pushed it out, they've documented the whole thing, and they've published the whole thing. So what this is, is a, a language for how you can manipulate data and transform data uh, and fully, fully published. Now, the nice thing with that is that M can do more things than what we can do in Power Query as yet. So Power Query is really a UI wrapper over the top of the M language. So anything you can do in the UI you could actually do in M instead. And so let me quickly show you where, where that applies. So in the case of this one that I was looking at a moment ago, we've built a bit of code that goes and reads a budget file, but the, the problem is that it's only reading one specific budget file. So instead, let's rename this and say this is going to be extract budget file instead. And we need to sort of generalize this. So it's a, a function that could read things from any budget file. Now, if we go to the view menu, now the reason that my formula bar appears at the top, which isn't necessarily always there, is that there's an option up here that says formula bar. And so that's what made that appear. Um, but there's also an advanced editor. Now, if I open up the advanced editor, what this does is it pops us into an, uh, basically a text editor where what we're looking at is the M language that is actually what's going on inside this Power Query file. And so in the case here, so extract budget file. So notice what I've got is I've got my file name tucked inside here. So this has said source, CSV document, file contents of that. And then it's done promote the header, change the type, rename the columns, unpivot the columns and so on. This is just a step-by-step -step thing that looks awfully familiar to what's going on in that applied steps part of the window that's off to the side. So let's just make a change here. So if I take out actually grab that file path and I'll just copy that out so I've got that for later. I'll drop that out. Let me rename that, replace that with a name. So I'll say file path and I've made that a variable but I need to pass that in. So the, the way I do that, uh, getting easier ways of doing this but let me show you what's going on here. So I've said look, file path is something that's going to come into this here and it we're using it here now that's made it into a more general setup hopefully that's the right button this thing actually covers up the button there we go so what i've now done is that notice i've actually created a query that instead of being a query is now a function instead and so what, what I can do is I could pop that file path in here and call invoke, and then I get back the invoked function as a query and a set of data sitting here. But in this case, that's, that's not what I want. I actually don't want the invoked function, but just, oh, sorry, what do I do? Put that back. Um, Now there's a thing I've never closed before. Let me see. I would have thought on the view menu. La bar query center. Oh, we'll come back to that anyway. So the, the thing is, I, I don't want that function to be there at the moment. 
So all I want is I've got my extract budget file. Now, what I can do then is say, okay, well, what can I do with that? So if I say close and apply, if I just say close and apply, then, then what I've done is notice nothing sort of appears. I've got sort of no data or anything here. But if I say, look, edit queries, I go back to the same window. But what I've got is this is now a function rather than a query that's sitting inside here. So what I can do is then use this as a new set of data that I could then go off and start to manipulate. And so notice I could say new source of data. And in this case, I could say, look, I want to, let's have a look. Instead of the CSV file, I want to connect to the folder. So let me push in the folder. I'll get rid of the file name off the end and OK. And then I've got the data in the folder itself as something I can manipulate. Now, if we look at this, so the content, actually, that's just the binary data. I don't want that. We've got the file name. I'm going to need that. The extension, the date, date modified. In fact, none of those I need. But I do need the path, and I do need the name. And so the path is going to be, you know, here's the folder that this is contained in, and then I've got the file name. Now, one of the things I do need is I need the whole path to the file. So if I said, look, add column, I could say add a custom column. And let me call that the same thing as I did before. I'll call that file path. And I am said that's going to be the folder path uh, and the name. And OK. And that'll then give me the entire file name sitting inside that. Now, once I get to that, notice I don't need the folder path anymore, so that can be gone. So the idea is you, I, I find in Power Query, I spend a lot of time just sort of removing the columns that I don't want anymore. And that's really good because it allows you to sort of get a cleaner and cleaner space to work with. Now, if I take this, uh, the name here, this is a, more of a challenge because the data contains the year. The name itself contains the year. So I could say split column by delimiter. I could say, give me a custom delimiter, say an underscore, and OK. Now, that's broken it out. I don't need the first part of the name anymore. And I actually don't even need the, the rest of the file name anymore. And so now I've got the year. I could rename that to year. And this has become part of my data. And so what I've now got is the year that it occurred, and here's the budgets for the year. But now what I need to do is use that function I built before to get the data from there. And so again, I can say add a custom column. And what I'll do here, say, look, I want to call the extract budget file function, pass in the file path, and OK. Now, what that's done is I've now got a table of data returned in every row of the data. OK, so I don't need the file path anymore. And what I can then do is expand out to whatever level I want the data from that. So let's just pop it all out. And so notice I've now got, for every year, the data sitting inside here. So I could rename this column here. Multiple selected. So I could say this is now my cinema group. This one here. Sales territory. I've got this one here is still as a short month name. I could have done this without the prefix. Anyway. And you just made it hard for yourself. Budget. Budget. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so look, that's, that's smooth. Now, the, the wonderful thing with this is if I refresh this, of course, it, it now reads every one of these files. And so it's not just the 2008 and so on. I've now got all of the data in there. And of course, because I've just read the folder, if I just then take another year's data and drop it in the same folder, 
you know the next refresh is going to pick up all the data so this is this is part of the power of power query is it's not just dealing with say tables of data what i can do is also use the language to go off and start building functions and things that's a look. so when you have queries you can append them so i could have say customers and then uh let's say uh, vendors or uh, suppliers and I could put the two queries together and maybe say here's my list of contacts so sort of like a SQL union uh, I can also join them like a, a sort of merge them like a join uh, and as we saw you can treat them like a function instead so the queries has a function so once you do that it's parameterizing the values um, it's getting easier and easier to create these all the time, but uh, I wanted to show you that uh, using M. And to alter these, all of the queries that you use when it's in Power BI Desktop, they all live uh, inside the single edit queries. Notice you've also got the ability to go back and change the data source settings too. So for example, if Wikipedia suddenly decided to put up a paywall, uh, and for going off and uh, looking at my Miss Universe winners, I need to now provide credentials or something. Uh, I've got the ability to start changing how I connect to that data source. And so that one I've already shown you in terms of functions. So look, that's where I wanted to get to today. So I just want to encourage you to go out and try this. And thanks for listening. And so, Chuck, just there any questions? There are a couple. And before we get to them, because I actually didn't know Power BI that well, so I was in the advanced editor all the time. I want you to give a stern warning about <laughs> about saving your work before you hit save, how there isn't control Z, um, saving your PDIX before you, so can you, can you talk to that a little bit? <laughs> okay, so what, one of the things that uh, anything you build in Power BI Desktop, uh, when you save it, the, the, the file format for that is a PBIX file. And, uh, and of course, that is the thing that you need to keep um, uh, whenever you're building these things out. It's also the file that you can upload. Uh, and notice, um, if I go back to this for a second, I'll go to my home tab and things so I, I can start building out queries and stuff here so let me say close and apply and that'll apply the changes uh, but notice up here the top I've also got the publish and so uh, this has got the ability of course this is something that I can then pick up and publish out to the Power BI site as well um, the PBIX files at the moment are the thing that you can keep uh, to to have some way uh, of uh, keeping a copy of your work, I suppose, is, is the thing that I'm sort of getting at. Um, there is a discussion at the moment. What, if I look at things that, gee, I wish they were there in the product already, um, more of a software life cycle is, is probably one of the key things I want. Um, and so, but the PBIX files at the moment, you, these are a good thing to work with on site. I tend to build them here, even though many of the things I could build in the Power BI site, um, you can't at the moment take things that you build directly in the site and bring them back down on premises. So I tend to build everything that I can inside PBIX files and push them up. And that way I have a local copy of the file. Uh, and that's also something I could push into a source code control system. That, so that's perfect. Thank you very much. You can hear me right now, Greg. Is that correct? Indeed. Yes. Okay. So um, Yaji Lee has, says that um, how friendly is Power BI to get data from OLAP or ProClarity into the sales data? Hmm. Okay. Uh, generally for most of the standard sort of queries to get into that, it, it's actually quite straightforward. The, I haven't tried anything with ProClarity uh, in that case. Um, in fact, the only thing I used to use with ProClarity, I, used to use, I actually used to love the ProClarity desktop professional uh, application as a sort of a thick client. But I must have been, most of the things I could do with that in the past, I, I can now use. And in fact, 
Power BI Desktop to do that and, and quite a bit more. There are still a couple of visualizations I used to like in that tool that haven't made their way in here yet. Um, but you know, generally, I, I find I can do more things with it. But in terms of sort of connecting out to all app data sources, now in fact, most of the work we do, uh, we tend to use Power BI Desktop connected to all app data sources. It's, it's usually SQL, uh, SQL Server analysis services. Predominantly nowadays, though, I might add, uh, we tend to use tabular rather than multidimensional for most new projects. Um, so Colleen and Kendall both go out and say, you, this is the best webinar they've ever um, seen. So kudos to you, Greg. And they both want Thank more you. content from you. So talk to May and see if we can get you back after Christmas. Kendall specifically mm -hmm. would say she would love to see more DAC stuff from you. So um, that's that. Yep. Charles yep. Webb was going out and saying, I'm curious as to whether functions work in the service, especially functions uh, and a, the append command. So I have played with this if you haven't, Greg, so I can answer it if you don't. Hey, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was going to say anything I've tried has worked, but is there something you found? Um, so the parameters, if you want to do refreshes, you got to be really careful about the parameters. Mm -hmm. If you go out and try to build parameters on the fly with like ampersand and concatenate with dates and whatnot, you won't be mm -hmm. able to refresh it. But, but all of those functions do work as long as you're careful about the parameters. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice some of my functions start looking kind of weird because of making sure mm -hmm. I can hard code the parameters coming in. Um, yeah, we, we don't tend to put a lot of them in directly. We tend to, I must admit, I tend to source the things that I want to do from something like a database or something like that. So. Yep. Um, actually, speaking of that, uh, one thing I haven't done is Dunn Dodson from 177 Energy was asking, can you do this from the F an FTP folder? I looked at web from web and it looks like it works, but I haven't tried it. Have you tried that, Greg? I haven't tried FTP, actually. Um, uh, well, I mean, I obviously tried FTP, but not from this, actually. Yeah. It, it, Don, take it for what it's worth. I went ahead and started that when I was answering these questions. It looks like From Web will actually let you um, grab that. So um, now whether or not you can go ahead and, and build those functions from an FTP site, I don't know. But it looks like From mm, Web. Like interesting. So it in the, yeah, you're, you're saying ahead. you just put an F, FTP moniker in front of instead of in the URL instead. The um, actually, it'd be interesting to find what it does and doesn't support there. Cause I must admit, most of the time I'm working in financials and SFTP. Unfortunately, is the the thing that most of them are after. It's secure FTP instead. So I, I don't usually get to go and hit standard FTP servers very often at all. Okay, and so again, the fact that I can do REST APIs and JSON through just that web uh, call is pretty amazing. Uh, Michael mm. Kirkhead, I'm sorry about your name and Rune. Uh, second, uh, the comments about you doing a great, great job. So thank you for that. Um, cool. Let me see if I'll get one more uh, question. Uh, Paul Turley was saying you should definitely be sending all your work anyways. Thanks for Paul. And he also says he's going to miss you at pass, So um, as we all are. <laughs> Indeed. Okay, so all with good. that, we, we are at the top of the hour. I want to thank you very, very much, Greg. Uh, you're worth chasing down, and if we can get you after Christmas with your favorite content, it sounds like the entire audience would love to have you back, and um, I would love to see you no matter what. If it's only virtually the best we can do, that's the best we could do. Too cool. Thanks, oh, folks. Actually, I wanted to, I wanted to show the uh, survey as far as what did you think about this. Uh, feel free to send that in, and then if you actually want to see more of Greg's content, I'm actually going to bring up a URL. Greg does blogs. Is it every week or every month? Uh, audio uh, blogs, blogs, as far as blogs, it. intermittent. But yeah, podcasts I do pretty regularly. The uh, uh, so what we do have, I have typically. You know, they're longer. They're hour long, fairly in depth interviews with people I think are notable in some way in in the data community. So, so I want to I want to parse that a little bit. That's less about Greg presenting, more about asking Greg to have other people present for him. So, but no matter what, I'm actually going to go ahead and, and open up that URL for Greg's uh, podcast. And if you haven't watched any or listened to any of them, they are worth listening to. So, Greg, again, thank you very much. Uh, Bill, this is a wrap. And you guys have a great weekend if I don't talk to you before. Awesome. Thanks, all.